Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Cyber Psychology uh, 2017 uh, workshop. And uh, this is uh, our first uh, workshop uh, focusing on cyber uh, psychology. However, this is uh, our second workshop for the cybersecurity related uh, workshops. Last year, we focused uh, on the general cybersecurity. This year, uh, we decided to focus on cyber psychology. So I would uh, just explain the rationale for that. So. Again, that, uh, my name is uh, George Xie. I'm a professor with the computer science department at the Norfolk State University. And uh, also, I'm the PI uh, for the Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity. Uh, this uh, center is uh, established uh, in April 2015 uh, with a uh, $5 million investment uh, from the uh, Department of Defense, Defense uh, so for five years. So we would uh, uh, cover from April 2015 to April uh, 2020. And uh, Ms. Kent is uh, our program manager that uh, funds uh, this uh, project uh, from uh, the Office of uh, the Secretary of Defense Office. And uh, also, this, uh, uh, this project uh, is uh, funded through a cooperative uh, uh, agreement uh, management, uh, cooperative management agreement. And uh, Dr. Parker uh, is uh, our main contact uh, one of our main contacts with the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, also for this uh, center, we have uh, one academic uh, partner, that's the ODU, and especially uh, the VMAS part of the ODU. So in concurrent uh, with uh, the workshop, we have two other activities. Uh, the first one is a cybersecurity summer internship uh, at the Norfolk State University. This is uh, our third year of uh, doing this uh, 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 work, uh, doing this uh, summer internship program, and uh, we have ten students from uh, five different universities on campus that started uh, last week, and they will go you know, until uh, uh, July 22nd. So we'd like to welcome them. In addition, we have a large contingent of students from ODU. They have been involved with various IEU uh, programs as well. So. No, we'd like to no, welcome the students. In addition, uh, uh, we would hold a COE advisory board meeting this afternoon. So if you see some of us could be you know, going to another meeting, that's uh, because we, uh, we would hold the advisory board meeting as well. The reason we are sponsoring this uh, cyber, school, uh, cyber psychology uh, uh, workshop uh, primarily because uh, when we started uh, with uh, this project two years ago, we went around uh, to talk to experts in the field, especially related to uh, cyber modeling and simulation uh, in terms of the priorities as uh, experts see in the field. So everybody told us that uh, human behavior modeling and simulation is among the top three priorities. So we heard that you know, human behavior modeling simulation. So with the extension, uh, we started uh, looking into cyber psychology because uh, that, uh, that's uh, what uh, people think that uh, it's a very difficult area. That's why there has not been a lot of progress. But uh, since uh, we, we are starting that project, so people advise us you know, to spend the, uh, effort in that area. So, so with, uh, as I said, that we started with uh, human behavior. Uh, modeling simulation. Now we are looking into the uh, uh, the, the cyber psychology as two high priority uh, work areas for the center. Overall, the center has about ten different uh, activities going on, research activities. So tomorrow morning, I would give a, a more detailed description about the center's uh, uh, research program. Uh, but uh, I'd like to highlight that the, the cyber psychology and the human behavior are two of about 10 uh, uh, research focus areas for us. In terms of uh, today's um, workshop, you know, we have uh, about 120 people registered. So, uh, so we'd like to at first uh, welcome our visitors from uh, international locations. Uh, so Dr. Granny Kerwin. Yeah, right there from uh, Ireland and uh, Dr. Melanie Kip uh, from Australia. Uh, in addition, we would uh, have uh, two speakers uh, joining by video. 
uh, one, uh, Dr. Mary Aiken uh, from Ireland today, and uh, Dr. Lee Hartington uh, from the UK tomorrow morning uh, through video. And, uh, and uh, we also have a person registered from NATO Transformation uh, Command. So I don't know if the person is here, but I consider that as uh, our international guest. Then from the DOD, we have uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, Ms. Kent's uh, office, and we have an Air Force Research Lab. We have uh, uh, Army Research Lab, and uh, we have uh, uh, Coast Guard. Uh, and uh, the NSA, uh, there are quite a few uh, organizations are represented. In terms of uh, at the federal level, we have uh, FBI and uh, Sandia National Labs. Yes, Kevin, <laughs> good. And uh, then we have also U.S. Uh, Senator Warner's uh, office uh, represented here. In terms of uh, local government, uh, we have uh, Norfolk and uh, Virginia Beach uh, business development uh, offices. They have uh, always been a very support of, uh, uh, strong supporters of our program. Then in terms of uh, business, uh, I just try to capture uh, uh, the ones that uh, I'm aware of. So if I miss anybody, you know, sorry. But, uh, because the registration comes in even as we speak now. Uh, then uh, most importantly, the students uh, and the universities. Uh, we have uh, four universities uh, represented uh, uh, internationally, from, uh, two from uh, Ireland, one from Australia, one from the UK. Then in addition, we have uh, in the US, uh, 22 different universities uh, represented, and uh, including uh, 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 quite a few from out of town. So we really appreciate it. Uh, people making an effort to come uh, all the way. And uh, the last one I wanted to highlight, that's a Virginia Consortium program in, in clinical psychology. That's uh, a PhD program. And uh, it's uh, established uh, with uh, NSU, ODU, and uh, Eastern uh, uh, Virginia Medical School. So we think uh, uh, those, uh, this, uh, the program will help us a lot in terms of uh, advancing uh, psychology and uh, cyberpsychology related activities. So, just uh, here, we just like to uh, express our appreciation for three major uh, funding sources uh, for us. Uh, definitely, the Department of Defense, uh, especially from uh, Evelyn, uh, from Ms. Kent's office, and the, uh, one grant we got earlier. So, we got about $12 million from DOD just from 2005. And in addition, we have I, uh, in information assurance scholarship uh, for about more than $300,000. And uh, we think we are getting more along that line, so we are happy. And the Department of Energy, uh, definitely the two major ones. Uh, one is the consortium uh, for K-20 cybersecurity workforce pipeline uh, project that's, uh, that's uh, uh, ongoing, and uh, we have uh, 12 other academic partners and the Sandia and the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So today we have Kevin from uh, Sandia. We have uh, uh, about uh, six uh, universities uh, from this uh, consortium. Then the NSF um, a scholarship for services uh, program, uh, we, we have received about $2 million to help not only us, but in also in working with uh, uh, other universities, uh, colleges like Tidewater uh, Community College to advance uh, cybersecurity related uh, education workforce uh, development uh, uh, projects. So that's just a very high level overview of uh, this workshop and why we are doing it. Uh, so again, we welcome everybody to this uh, workshop. And with that, uh, it's our great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Stacy Jones, she is uh, our provost and uh, vice president of academic affairs. She has been a strong, a strong supporter and a champion for cybersecurity related activities at uh, NSU. So we appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. I think he just says that because I'm a computer scientist. <laughs> but good morning, and certainly on behalf of our uh, president and the entire Norfolk State University family, welcome to. Norfolk State University, welcome to Norfolk, Nor work, welcome to Virginia, and I think because we have a number of international uh, participants, welcome to the United States of America, I guess, for the next uh, day and a half or so. So based on the list of those who are assembled here, 
I know I don't have to tell you this, but I think Dr. Shea is expecting me to say something for at least two minutes, so. Um, but cybersecurity, and more specifically, the thoughts, the behavior patterns, uh, tactics of manipulation, et cetera, it's critical. It's critical. And therein lies the reason for the focus on uh, cyber psychology. And if we look at, I'll say the warfare, yeah, it's changed, right? So uh, a long time ago, it used to be fist to fist. Then it was rock to rock, and then maybe some arrows, or then there's arsenal, then there's nuclear and uh, economic warfare. But now it's a war warfare, a technological warfare, but of the minds. And so you are to be congratulated, Dr. Uh, Shea, Dr. Deb. Um, I know Ms. Fields is around here um, for coordinating this um, and bringing together the best minds to address those minds that maybe would not be uh, or might not have our um, best interests at heart. Uh, I want to add to the thank yous to the Department of Defense. Uh, and I don't have the list in front of me, but um, all the universities, um, and especially the students. Uh, I, would, I know today, and I'm jealous, by the way, that I can't stay here with you the entire today, uh, day, but I do know um, that you're gonna engage in discussions, uh, collaborations, partnerships, and other things that, again, I'm jealous that I can't be a part of. Um, but the expectation for, for me, I don't know what you all have set for the goals, but the expectation for me would be on the other side of this that we actually have um, some next steps and some very specific projects that we're going to go on to um, work on together. This is an incredible opportunity for um, certainly the, our Center of Excellence to have this assembly of, uh, of participants. And we don't want to squander this time, right? I mean, we want to make the best of this. I, don't, I looked again down the list, and I don't think I've actually seen a list of um, participants with that much depth um, and, and focus on this area in a long time. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it, uh, but you're here. So Dr. Shea, um, I'll be you know, watching on the other side of this to see what the, uh, the to-do list is. So again, uh, welcome to Norfolk State University. Um, enjoy your day, and I hope I get a chance to actually come back and spend a little time with you. Thank you. Hi, and thank you for coming today. I'm Dr. Scott Deb. Thank you, Provost Jones. George, thank you very much for everything that you've done to support cyber psychology to this point and hopefully a lot further. I wanted just to take a moment to go over some of the goals of the workshop. Um, definitely, we want to build partnerships. We want to establish ways to collaborate with people that are focusing on cybersecurity, that are focusing on looking at behavior, that are trying to incorporate the psychological aspect of anything that they're doing that's related to technology. So we want to showcase cyber psychology as a relevant field. It's not really that well known, especially in the United States, um, but it's a niche field that is extremely important. And one of the things that we want to do is show how understanding how technology is impacting human behavior, we want to be able to show how it's important not just to understand that as a concept, but to be able to research it, study it, examine it, see how it's going to impact people from a proactive rather than a, a purely reactive standpoint. So we want to, part of this workshop is to overlay cyber psychology and cybersecurity. One of the big things with Norfolk State University right now is this big push in cybersecurity. As George mentioned, there's a huge depth of funding and extremely bright people that have been looking at the cybersecurity, the technical aspects of it, for a number of years at this point. And they've done a tremendous job. 
we are trying to complement that. We want to be able to help show the importance of these behavioral components in order to make their job just a little bit easier and in the process establishing cyber psychology as something that's relevant for everyone in different fields because technology is so prevalent and impacts just about everyone in the world, whether you're a consumer, a direct consumer of technology, uh, computer technology that is, or whether you just impacted by it um, secondarily. So we're trying to make this case for cyber psychology. We want to establish partnerships and collaborations. We are looking for feedback uh, for educational opportunities for our students. Uh, Norfolk State has a master's program in cybersecurity. We're trying to roll out a master's of science program in cyber psychology to start next fall as well. And one of the things that we're looking for is to get our students involved in the problems that are being worked on outside of the university. We don't want to, certainly we want to have a lot of the research that's done in-house for the sake of academic purposes and looking into things and intellectual curiosity, that's definitely uh, really important. We want to also be able to make it relevant to the real world. We don't want it to be housed inside of a uh, lecture hall, never to escape. We want it to be able to impact people. We want it to be utilized by the individuals who need it, no matter what they're doing. So along with this Masters of Science program that we're working on, and that we're developing the curriculum for at this point, uh, George had mentioned the Virginia Consortium Program in Clinical Psychology. That is an integral part of what we're trying to accomplish. This is a consortium PhD program in clinical psychology, and it's three schools that are in this area, Norfolk State, ODU, Old Dominion University, and Eastern Virginia Medical School. And one of the, th the big things is utilizing the graduate students from that program. One of my uh, graduate students is here, uh, and she'll be talking a little bit with us d during these next two days as well. Because there's a huge overlap with clinical psychology uh, with these issues, with cybersecurity issues, with technology and how it's impacting human behavior and influencing people. So we don't want it to be this uh, siloed thing that never escapes. We want it to be able to transcend different areas, whether it's within the different discipline areas within psychology, and certainly expanding beyond the borders of psychology. So we tried to put together a diverse, but ultimately all related group of unique speakers from a local area, regionally, nationally, and to our international guests, thank you very much for coming. Uh, there won't be one talk necessarily that's gonna cover everything about cyber psychology, so if you're looking for what is cyber psychology as a definition or a word in bold in the textbook, you're not gonna find it necessarily. But what you will find is all the different speakers and their perspectives and their research and their experience coming together to form, well hopefully for you to form, your own definition of cyber psychology and how you feel behavior is impacting people every day. So the combination of these talks, our subsequent discussions that we'll have formally and informally over the next two days, I hope will be really productive. And I wanted to showcase the interdisciplinary aspects of what we're trying to accomplish and what's being set up uh, through the Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity. So our first talk today uh, is going to be delivered by Tim Croker, who is Senior Operations Research Analyst for the Air Force Research Lab. His leadership has helped guide the Center of Excellence to achieve its fullest potential at this point. And so at this time, I'd like to welcome Tim up to say a few words. So we're going to change the program just a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask Evelyn Kent from the Office of the Secretary of Defense to just uh, say a few words. Uh, good morning, folks. You probably look at the agenda and you see that I'm on there for 1.40, I think right after lunch but I need to get back to uh, Washington, D.C. We have a lot going on. So first, I want to say thank you. It's always uh, good to see such a large crowd of people in the summertime that's so interested in staying on campus and getting these things done. 
So thank you uh, again. Uh, what this grant is a little more than 25 uh, months plus uh, from the Office of Secretary of Defense. We uh, focused on uh, awarding this uh, cooperative agreement in the area of cybersecurity. Uh, so as you can see and know, and you look around and you hear every day. The number one cybersecurity issue that everyone's talking about is Russia, right? <laughs> so you're not going to get away from it. That's just number one. You know, number two and other things that's going on as well uh, involves uh, cybersecurity and what we do every day. And if you're anything like the Pentagon, we have updates every day uh, as far as our security system is concerned. Uh, things move a lot slower than they used to because they're looking at everything that comes in and everything that goes out now more so than they did before. So I'm hoping that uh, Norfolk State University and other universities that you're partnering with and other companies and agencies as you sustain this center of excellence will be able to help us uh, in those areas of cybersecurity. Again, I want to thank Dr. George. <laughs> and the team, Tim and Dr. Charles Kumwa, he's not here today. He was the program manager for the Air Force Research Lab, but he's on his way. So he will be leaving us and, and moving on to the Army Research Lab next week. So he's turning it over to uh, Dr. Jalan, and uh, so I think we'll be in good hands. So again, I want to say thank you to the great job that you're doing here. I would not be able to stay long, but I wanted to take a little time to come and show the Office of Secretary of Defense presence and that we're excited about what you're doing here at Norfolk State. Thank you. So I'm going to apologize in advance. My PowerPoint creation skills are probably not up to snuff for a lot of people here. but. I, and I have a lot of words. But beyond that, what I really wanted to talk about is how excited I am to have this group of people and the support from the OSD um, in various forms and flavors, as well as AFRL, um, uh, to do this kind of work. Um, actually, I'm probably one of the few people in uh, my lab. I work at the Air Force Research Lab in the Information Directorate in Rome, New York. And there's about 400 computer scientists and electrical engineers. I'm the one and only psychologist. So most of the time I go to conferences, they talk about things I really don't have a grip on. Today I get to, I get to have the other side of the, the fence, and I'm excited about that. Um, I have a uh, PhD in industrial organizational psychology, so I'm fairly numerate, and I'm also fairly technical, um, which I enjoy a lot. Uh, I rarely get to see an intersection, and over the last few years, um, based on the research that I've been doing at the lab, as well as my interactions with George and Jose and uh, Sachin, we're starting to see some overlap between the two very disparate disciplines come about. So last year we had, a, um, I also do a lot of intern programs, some of you know that already, and on Monday we had, at our research lab, we had 110 interns arrive. So, as I said, there's 400 of us, so we just swelled almost like 25, 30%. And last year, we had an intern from uh, Old Dominion University, and she and I started to talk. And we came up with a, a project for her to start looking at how to use her background as a mathematician to look at how to predict um, insider threats within an organization. So it just started to kick off these ideas about how we could merge different disciplines within our lab to talk about that. And based on that and some conversations with George and Scott Deb, um, we started to put, put things together. And then we started to look around in different places to find people that were interested in this idea um, and also who have done some research. There is no single place that I've been able to find that does this kind of work. There is no one place. It is very small threads in different labs, in different organizations within the DOD and Department of Homeland Security, and there's some at NSF. So what I'm going to do today is basically, um, once you're inside the DOD and you start learning how to think about how they think about things, it's much easier to find things. So what I wanted to do today is show you some of those different threads that are in the DOD 
um, and the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Coast Guard, um, different organizations that are looking at this idea. It isn't pulled together into one program like you might see um, in other places, but eventually when we have conferences like this with a great group of minds coming together, we actually can create a discipline and hopefully uh, a center of excellence in this kind of area. Um, I think I've kind of generally what I wanted to say on this slide. And George, I'll ask you to give me a heads up when I'm, I'm out of time. Um, so the first thing I did is I looked up the National Science Foundation and I just scanned all of their sites just to see some of what they're doing that would impact what, um, what I would call the intersection between um, humans and cyberspace or psych, uh, cyber psychology. I'm taking a fairly broad definition of both cyber and psychology simply because um, it's such an undefined field that the broader that we start with, that we can eventually narrow. So there's lots of things that are going on. One of the other centers that I work with does big data analysis. There's a huge intersection between the idea of taking large bits of information um, and coalescing that into useful information that you can turn into um, real decision making. If you're thinking about gigabytes of data that are coming in every day into the DOD and into the decisions that the military need to make, how do you coalesce that into a meaningful action list for someone to look at quickly? So that's part of what I think is an important part of this intersection between cyber and psychology. And the National Science Foundation has um, a program called Harnessing Data for the 21st Century in Science and Engineering. So the reason why I've started to put these things on the slide for you isn't because I need you to necessarily read all the tiny words that I've got on the slide. It's more to give you a sense of where to start looking for people that are interested in these ideas and who has funding against these ideas. So if you're a researcher or you want to collaborate or you want to find out, I'd encourage you to Google each one of these terms that you find interesting so that you can dig further and find out the people that are associated with it. Um, as an industrial organizational psychologist, I have to say I loved the second one that the National Science Foundation is working on, which is um, the human technology frontier in the workplace. Work has changed enormously since I started working, geez, back in the 80s. Back then, you, I, I would have to, uh, I worked in a library, and I had to do card catalog filing, and I had to do it by hand. It took forever. It would take me at least four hours to do a thousand cards. They don't even have card catalogs anymore. Everything is online and everything is automatically done for you. So you're taking people who used to be high school students who would do this really menial work, but they loved books and they were in a place they, were, they liked. Now they're using Google to do other things in a more powerful way, in a basic way. So the same thing is going on in all sorts of ways in, in the frontier. Um, so the more that we can look at those kinds of ideas and how that impacts your work would be good. So um, several years ago, there was something called the third offset, and that was by Secretary Work. And the third offset um, is no longer, a, I don't think it's a term that's um, in favor anymore, uh, but the ideas are still there. So the Secretary Work is no longer the Secretary of Defense anymore, but um, his, his ideas are still um, holding traction. And the third offset was about trying to make sure that the United States could maintain military superiority in the next um, 10, 20, 50 years. And the way that they really wanted to do that was by looking at um, important intersections. So the first was understanding how deep learning is going to impact how we do things. Deep learning, I'm sure many of you already know, is all about under teaching computers to look at large data sets and large different um, pieces of information and find patterns and predictions, and then make decisions based on the patterns and predictions that it finds. Um, but the, the problem is, is a computer can do it one way, but the mind and humans do it another way. So how do we make that intersection between the human and, and deep learning more seamless? The other one is human-machine collaboration. Um, one of the things I I'm fascinated by with human-machine collaboration is how it's slowly but surely creeping into our psyche and we don't even realize it. 20 years ago, a mobile phone was about the size of this microphone, if not bigger. And now, like, I have a computer in my pocket that does everything that my Apple IIe 
does and more and it's in my pocket. And we all carry these things and we all stare at these things and we all communicate and we don't realize how much of an impact that's having on us. And we need to start figuring out what that impact means both in the work world as well as to the DOD. Um, the other thing um, that we talk about in terms of the human machine combat teaming. So yeah, we all understand that people have used rocks, people have used guns, people are using tanks. If you look at commercials, there's been a slow but sure creep into it where you see that people who have artificial limbs, those artificial limbs are obviously artificial. And 10, 20 years ago, we'd all stop and stare at that kind of thing and think, that's pretty weird. Now it's, now it's just part of our conscious that we see people with very, dis di very different looking limbs, whether they're created through um, uh, uh, machinist shops or whether they're created through 3D printing. That stuff is starting to creep into our, into our work world as well as our everyday lives. What's that gonna mean for the psychology of what we do? So that's another way to start thinking about that. Um, for the assisted human operations, um, that's a little more of the same. One of the things I, I really find interesting about this idea of human-machine collaboration and the assisted human operations is that right now we really don't want machines to make lethal decisions. Um, so what's going to happen is computers are going to work with you, you're going to think about things, and then it's going to present you with a decision. But humans don't think as, as fast as machines. So how are you going to be able to sit there and make a lethal decision with something going really quickly in front of you and then a decision? What's that going to mean for the psyche of the person and what's that going to mean for the long-term um, type of people that go into the military? Um, and I, I'm going to let people who are much more technically savvy talk about things like network-enabled cyber-hardened weapons. Um, It's a fascinating idea that um, they came up with. So the mythology of, of um, a centaur, what that talks about is the integration of the power of a horse back, back in the days before technology and using the power and the speed of a horse combined with a human to make a new creation that was both powerful, deadly, and humane. And so... Um, I know that uh, I think it was um, uh, Senator, uh, pardon me, uh, Secretary Work that kind of came up with the idea of kind of using the power of technology and harnessing it in the same way. And, and that's the kind of things that, um, that you'll see. Um, and I do know that these slides are going to be um, available to everyone. So if you're taking notes and such, um, I've tried to put as many of my so uh, sources down. Um, most of, almost all of this, in fact, all of it, is publicly available. So if you Google any one of these terms, you'll easily find them. And then you can start digging down further. I'm going to digress a little bit because these, these images were fascinating. When, when you look up cybersecurity and then you look up cyber psychology, you get, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred images. None of them are happy images. <laughs> these, these, no one thinks, of, no one thinks of, of this combination of cyber and security and, and psychology as being joyful, being useful, being healing. They think of it as people in hoodies doing bad things. <laughs> so um, I, I think as a group, if you're really interested in the idea of cyber and psychology, we have to start kind of changing that to show that there's also power for good in this as opposed to just fearful. Um, okay, so why is this approach important? The, the advantages that the U.S. used to have in the, um, in the old days, whatever they were, um, was that uh, we had precision, we had the ability to surveil, surveil the world, and we had networks that connected to one another and enabled us to maintain our military superiority. But now, not only are our adversaries like uh, Russia and China and other countries are equal, there are smaller groups that use the power of technology to go around all the things that we've already created. So the third offset, or these strategies, really was about a different way of thinking so that we could maintain um, control and, and, and superiority that way. Um, the other thing I'm going to point out here is 
Um, the Pentagon has dedicated $18 billion since 2016 to researching and developing third offset strategies. That's not an insignificant amount of money. Now, the third offset might have gone away in terms of that, that coining of a phrase, but that money is still out there and there are still people that are really interested in doing this. So I, I encourage you to start looking for, for proposals, for ideas that are out there in order to propose against. Um, <clears throat> the reason why it's important to look at the third offset and why, we, why we've maintained our superiority over the years is that our military works together pretty seamlessly. Um, there, are, there are many instances of rivalry, um, good, good comrad comradeship, but more than anything, when they deploy and when they are doing the work of the nation, they work together well. Many of our um, adversaries don't have that. So that's a really important thing that if we can augment with the power of cyber and psychology, it would only do well. We also have the advantage of our industrial base. We have a powerful, powerful industrial base. And I'm so excited to see some people from industry here because they are actually going to be the ones that take our ideas and turn them into reality um, for everyday life. So again, I encourage you to look not only for the DOD um, and the DHS for funding, but also look and see what industry is doing. Um, and we're probably amongst the most technically savvy people um, in, in the world, and that's our biggest strength. We have all these students and we have 110 interns at Rome Labs because we know that they are the most valuable resource that we've had. So this is an eyesore chart. I apologize for that. Um, I do want to point out that in terms of the Air Force and the cyber s and roadmap, they're looking at um, human optimizing human machine systems. So um, they're looking at things like, uh, gee, I'm going to actually have to read my own papers here in a minute. Um, but if you look at that, if you look at those key for words, this is from a chart that's called lead leverage watch. And where you see the L, that's, that's where the Air Force wants to lead. So by looking up these terms and looking up the Air Force, if you've got an idea that lends itself to that idea, you can start digging down deeper and getting some interesting information about it. If it's leverage, we're looking for people who've already come up with ideas and who are um, interested in, in making it bigger and scaling it up. And if it's watch, we're looking for people who are so, like they're thinking so far into the future that we just have to watch and see where it's going to go. This conference is probably something that we would call a watch because if it takes off and people like this idea, we can eventually lead in that idea. So uh, there are many people who don't necessarily know much about the Air Force Research Labs. There are actually nine labs, sometimes ten, depending on how you want to count them. Um, and we have the information directorate, and we essentially look at anything that looks at computers. If it touches the computer in any way, shape, or form, we probably have ten or fifteen people working on it to understand it and make use of it. But we have another uh, lab, and that's in um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and that's the Human Performance Wing. And the Human Performance Wing is essentially there to understand um, the airman systems, uh, aerospace medicine, and human systems uh, integration. So that's the one that would really have probably the most interest in this conference. And I know I have some contacts there that couldn't make it today, but those are the people that you want to start looking for if you're interested in working with the Air Force and trying to find funding to do your research. Um, and I will also say that uh, we have something called um, I think it's called Visions, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's s and Visions, and on their list even six years ago was to create cyborgs. So there are people who really want to do this stuff even though it is a little science fiction-y. So you also know that um, there's the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. There are several um, portfolios that you should be looking at in terms of um, I, I don't know exactly how many portfolios they have, but one of them talks about computational cognition and machine intelligence research. And those are some, some brief um, ideas about what falls under that portfolio, and there will be a name that's associated with that particular, particular portfolio of research. So if you look them up 
and you have an idea, you, you should send them a couple of sentences or maybe a page, not longer than a page. They won't read a lot of things unless they know you, um, to find out if what you're interested in proposing would fit within their portfolio. So, um, I also looked up the Office of Naval Research, and I think we have a gentleman here from the Office of Naval Research. No? There you go. There you go. Um, this, is, this is what uh, they're looking at in terms of their objectives. So, they're looking at unmanned and human systems. Naturally, we're the Air Force, so we generally look at things in, in space, in outer space, the air, and cyberspace is one of the other areas. Um, the Navy looks at on, on the ocean and under the ocean. So the way that you would team and what you would team and how you would team would differ depending on what element you're in. But these are the, these are the five major objectives that they've got. So if you were to look those up and start trying to figure out who's interested in that within the Navy, that would be a good place to start. Uh, this is specifically from the Office of the Naval Research and this is one of their um, portfolios. It's along the same lines, but just one level deeper. Um, the, the interesting idea about nanotechnology and um, integrating people with that is it, kind of an interesting idea. We are, we're starting to, uh, even on the plane ride down, there was a guy on, the, on the, the plane in front of me who had a cochlear implant. You know, that, that implant enables a deaf person to hear. That really changes that person's world. What else are we going to put into that cochlear implant and see what else that we could do with that person? Because um, I know we're heading in those directions. Um, and again, I'm not going to, I'm absolutely not going to read every word on these charts. I put these together for you guys to use as a source document. Um, I did, I looked up the Army Research, and we have an awesome connection now. Dr. Kamul, who's moving to the Army Research Lab, who was the leader here uh, for quite a while, they're interested. Um, you know, they look much more at the person in ground war fighting. So they're looking for information supremacy, lethality, lethality and project, protection superiority, and soldier performance augmentation. These are all a lot of the same ideas, they just have a slightly different spin on them. So that's the other way to think about when you're, if you're going to propose for any of these kinds of ideas, you can take the same idea and just morph it just a little for different services because each one of the services has a different area about what they're trying to do. So if you have an idea for how cyber and psychology uh, could be managed in such a way to um, prevent mental fatigue if you have to look at uh, um, surveillance videos over long periods of time, each one of the services is going to have that need but they're just looking at different things, and you could change your, your proposals and your ideas to morph it that way. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so there are several campaigns. I think there are eight in total that the Army Research Lab looks at. I wanted to point out that these three were ones that all fall into um, what we call this kind of intersection between cyber and psychology. Um, I, I'm, I'll keep going here. So I don't know much about the Department of Homeland Security. I actually used to work with uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol for quite a few years. Um, I, I helped them understand how to uh, hire and select um, agents, which was pretty interesting. So I used to do profiling of agents so that we could figure out how to select the next ones and also um, how to train them. Um, they have a slightly different um, perspective on things. Is there anybody here from the TSA? Good. I just wanted to make sure because I, I actually used to work with the TSA when they first started back in 2001. They went from zero people to 50,000 people in six months. That's an enormous change to, uh, to have enacted across the United States. But if they could get close to screening at the speed of light, I would certainly appreciate that. Um, um, but they're looking at different, different types of crimes. There's, you know, a lot of things that are the reasons why you have such dark images associated with cyber and psychology is because that's how most of us learn about this intersection. There's things like cyber crime. There's uh, 
child pornography. There's all sorts of things that are, are now being enabled across the globe in ways that they never could have been enacted before, and they are crossing into our borders. So if anybody's got a real interest in, in how to stop and prevent that using cyber and psychology, that would be a, a, a big kudos for everyone. Um, I think the, probably the common denominator here is going to be the decision making. The more that we could make decision making easier and faster, taking huge, huge amounts of data and coalescing it into small, understandable decision bites would be a great thing. So uh, I, I'll, I'll confess here, my, my nephew is actually in the Coast Guard. He's down the street. Um, he's an 04, and he's, I sent him this, uh, the, the announcement about this, and I asked him to share it with his Coasties, because we never get them represented. So I'm happy that you're here. Um, there is actually, um, uh, I think it's in New London, Connecticut. There's a research group, and these are some of the things that they're researching as well. Um, and in fact, over the years, we've had a couple of interns that are actually now at, at, at New London uh, and working with the Navy and the Coast Guard. Um, and all of them are looking at these kinds of things. I believe that's pretty much close to my last slide. It is my last slide. So uh, I'm op certainly open for questions. I have lots of kind of off-the-wall ideas that I'd love to pursue over time. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, lots of folks do things like training the discipline to aim them towards cyber capability, if you will. And then the psychologists train towards research and what's on there. They learn. Mm -hmm. The question is are you sponsoring or do you know of people who are sponsoring research explicitly focused on hiding from their kids and go, what's your material over to a computer or a system system so they have a physical tool? And which stage do you think your parents have to get in line? I would say that we have at least two branches in my directorate alone that consider that pretty seriously. Um, for the most part, we have a command and control um, division, and within that division, there are people that are trying to figure out how best to articulate tasks and then assign them uh, based on whether or not a computer would be better at it or a human would be better at it. So. so there, there's a quite a lot of interest in this area, absolutely. Does that answer your question? It does. Now I need to go find the, the literature. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I actually spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out what I would do for this presentation because I kept looking and looking and not finding anything that I could kind of pull together and say, here, guys, here's a list of names. These are the people you need to talk to. And I really couldn't do that. There is a journal of cyber psychology, if those of you who are, uh, it's online. It's got some interesting stuff. It's about nine years old. Most of it has to do with cyber addiction. Um, some of it has to do with understanding um, the characteristics of people who um, might be hackers. Um, some of it has to do with uh, people who might fall for, for phishing and whaling attempts. So, and, and that, of course, is a big interest for the military because if we can figure out ways to train people or talk to people so that they don't fall for those scams, it only makes it better for all of us. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, Tom Stolle, I'm from Mimic. So, business development hat on here. What I uh, hear you telling me is that this stuff is all sort of disjointed and out there. Correct. Just
so then I would also say it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing here. We, we definitely can put some money on the table, but we also want to see what do you got. You know, interesting ideas are great. Show us something that works. And then, then things tend to follow. Um, anything? Yes? Yes, sir. Sure. Um, so in my past life, I was actually in business development. So commercialization is something I generally kind of understand. Um, I know that the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York, has something called the Commercialization Academy. And if you come to Rome and you look at the, the patents that we have and you can figure out how to use those patents and turn it into a business model that you could sell, we will help you do it. Because we understand that there's a lot out there that uh, will uh, be useful, but we need somebody to take it to the next level because our researchers are researchers for a reason. They're not business developers. They're not thinking about the world that way. So, um, and I'm, I'm fairly certain that each of the military branches has something like the Commercialization Academy. If you're interested in learning more about that, I think my, my information's going to be somewhere. Shoot me an email and I'll get you hooked up that way. Um, just in terms of how interested we are in that kind of idea, for those of you who are, who are Apple aficionados, Siri, the initial stuff was developed at Rome Labs. Um, uh, latex paint, it's one of my favorite stories. Sorry, I, you guys have heard this like nine times now. Um, latex paint was developed at Rome Labs. That has nothing to do whatsoever with cybersecurity, but because we had to protect radars and satellite dishes and stuff in bad weather, somebody came up with a sil single polymer um, film and it turned into latex paint. And that has prevented lead poisoning throughout the world. And that's a good commercialization story. Um, anything else? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tim. We'd like to present you with this certificate of appreciation for your guidance and leadership with everything. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.